My, uh, my 30th high school reunion is going to be July 29th, here coming up in a few weeks. 30 years. I went to Westerville North High School in Westerville, Ohio, and there were over 400 students in my graduating class. I don't keep in touch with most of them. In fact, I only am friends with a few of them on Facebook. Otherwise, I don't have any other contact with any of them. So going back for the reunion wouldn't be much of a reunion or a homecoming because I don't really have those significant ties with them. But I got to thinking about that. 30 years, that's a pretty long time. It makes me feel pretty old. 30 years since my high school uh, reunion or my high school graduation. It's hard to believe that it's been that long. And I started to do the math a little bit this week. It, I, I realized that I have been here in Missouri for 25 years, one year longer than I lived in Ohio for 24 years, where I graduated high school and college. So I've been here longer than I had been in Ohio. So, uh, I got to thinking about that this week. And, and, I, and I thought, well, I'm not gonna go to the high school reunion, but I do have a homecoming of sorts that I participate in every year. Dolores mentioned her Christmas and July celebration. Well, my family goes to Ohio um, almost every year for Christmas time to be with my family, my side of the family, whom we see once or maybe twice a year if we're, if we're blessed to have that opportunity. And so we go for, for Christmas to my family in Ohio. It's a homecoming for me at least, not for the rest of my sisters and their families live there. My three younger sisters and their families live there already. So for me though, it's a homecoming. It's a reunion. I get to see the family that I don't see very much at all throughout the whole year. I get to participate in the family traditions that we have. We, we get together as a family almost every night when I'm home. There's now 24 of us as part of my immediate family. Now that my nephew has been married, it's up to 24 now. And we gather for food and, and meals together. We play lots of games. We eat chocolate mint freeze. If you've never had that, talk to Martha White. She knows how to make it. I gave her the recipe one time and she makes it for us periodically. We, we just spend a lot of time together. We go to Christmas Eve service. We read the nativity story before we open gifts as, as Dolores does as well. We have the Louise Ray Prank Award that we give out every year. That's named after my grandmother who started the tradition when she gave my brother-in-law Ben an empty box for Christmas with the note that said, here's your melted snowman. So we, we have this award that we give out every year for prank gifts. And for me, every year, it's a homecoming. It's a reunion. It's a celebration. Well, in Isaiah 60, he envisions two family reunions or homecomings. One that's already happened since this prophecy, and one that remains still in the future that we will be able to participate in if we know the Lord. The first one's announced to these people who are in exile in Babylon. And the second one still remains in the future. A glorious homecoming that we'll get to in our text today. Which invites us to begin to ask the question that I want to ask throughout the sermon today. Have you thought about home recently? <laughs> Have you thought about home recently? There's lots of ways that that could be answered but we're gonna, we're gonna be looking at these homecomings as we go through the text today that'll help us address that question. Have you thought about home recently? We find our text in Isaiah 60, verses one through 13 to begin with. This is the word of the Lord. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will rise upon you and his glory will appear over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. Though all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from far away. Your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your hearts shall rejoice, shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover, cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephthah, all those from Sheba shall come. Those, they shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. 
All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered to you, and the rams of Nebaoth shall minister to you. They shall be acceptable on my altar, and I will glorify my glorious house. Who are these that fly like a cloud, like doves to their nest? For the coastland shall wait for me, the ships of Tarshish first, to bring your children from far away, their silver and gold with them. For the name of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified you. Foreigners shall build up your walls and their king shall minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you down, but in my favor I will have mercy on you. Your gate shall always be open. Day and night they shall not be shut, so that the nations shall bring to you their wealth and with their kings led in procession. For the nation and the kingdom that will not serve you, they shall perish. Those nations shall be utterly laid to waste. The glory of Lebanon shall come to you, the cypress, the plain, and the pine. They shall beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will glorify where my feet rest. The word of the Lord. Keep it open to that because we'll be touching on other verses that I won't read today, and then we'll read some other portions as well. Just to give you a little bit of review, because we're covering this portion of Isaiah. Isaiah is a 8th century Hebrew prophet who was a prophet to the southern kingdom of Israel, Judah and Jerusalem. And he was announcing to them that what happened to Israel could happen to them. It happens during his prophetic ministry that the northern kingdom of Israel falls and collapses in 722 to Assyria. And he's announcing to Judah don't be boastful and proud. It can happen to you if you won't return to the Lord. If you don't turn away from your sin and your wickedness and your idolatry, the same could happen to you. And throughout, there's warnings of judgment, warnings that this could happen, especially in Isaiah 1-39. through And they don't heed the warning, though. They don't return to the Lord. And by the end of Isaiah 39, he announces that there's going to be exile to the, to the place of Babylon. The people are going to go there. And that's exactly what happens. The people are sent into exile because they won't return to the Lord. The good news, though, is announced in, in chapters 40 to 55. The good news is announced that the exiles are going to be brought back home. A homecoming. A reunion. From all the places that they've been scattered. They're going to be brought back by the Lord. The Lord's going to gather them back home to the promised land, to Jerusalem. He's going to bring them back. He pronounces this. He picks, he picks up on all these promises in chapters 1 through 39 in this section as well. And then especially in chapters 44 and 45, he even says who's going, to, who's going to start the whole process. He says Cyrus, this king, is going to be the one who announces and gives a decree to the exiles and from everyone among his people to come back, to come back home. And to rebuild the temple. He's named by name Cyrus in chapter 45. This king of Persia is going to announce this and allow the people to come back to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem that now lie in ruins. And in chapter 60, the chapter we're in, it picks up on that, that those things have happened. That, that, the, that Jerusalem has endured this period of affliction. Peter Wagner says verses 10, 14, 15, and 20 pick up on this, that there has been a, a time of affliction that has now ended. And this reflects the fall of Jerusalem. This reflects this time of exile away. This reflects the fact that Judah has, 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 has been conquered, but also that Jerusalem and its temple has been burned down and is in ruins. They went through that. They've gone through that. But the good news is now, look at verse 8. The good news now, look at verse 4, is that the sons and daughters are going to be called back home to Zion. The sons and daughters are going to be brought back, brought back home. Verse 8 puts it this way, As a dove returns to its nest, Jerusalem's children will be brought back home. Not only that, notice the nations will also come and bring their wealth and riches with them. 
And in light of chapter 56 and 49 that we looked at a couple of weeks ago that talks about how God's heart is for the whole world. He wants everyone to come to know him. In fact, it picks up on chapter 42, there's some cross reference here where the Lord says, turn to me. He's speaking to all the nations. He says, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is no other. The Full Life Study Bible says, God gives an invitation to all the nations, to all of the people of the earth to repent and to turn to him for salvation. And the gospel of Christ contains that same invitation and God has commanded his church to take the good news to all the world for that's his desire, that people would come to know him. Notice why the people are coming. They notice that God's doing something for his people. They'll notice that the people are being brought back home. And not only that, they'll notice that God is restoring what had been ruined. They'll, they'll, they'll not only see that the exiles are returning, but they will see that the shameful state of Jerusalem is being reversed. Verse 10, the broken down walls are going to be rebuilt. Verse 15, we didn't read, long considered forsaken and hated, the Lord will make Jerusalem the pride and joy of all the generations. Verse 20, their days of sorrow will end. Verse 21, her corruption will be smelted away and it will be a faithful city, which is the opposite depiction of, uh, of Jerusalem in chapter 1, where it's called this corrupt city. God's going to do a work and the nations are going to recognize it. He's going to bring his people home. This is beauty for ashes. Literally speaking, beauty for ashes. Jerusalem is in ruins. Everything has been burned down. And now the restoration of Jerusalem is being announced and that all these people are going to come and that it will make Jerusalem swell with joy. And this is going to happen because the glory of the Lord will rise upon Israel. I thought of that priestly blessing in, in Numbers chapter 6 where the Lord says, the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace. The Lord's countenance be upon you and give you, give you, give you his favor. That's what's being announced. The Lord's going to do that for Jerusalem. This priestly blessing is going to be enacted upon his people. And the exiles are going to be coming back home. I, uh, I put together this image for this sermon series. And you've, I hope you've noticed it the last several weeks. This flower on the, on the slide here is called fireweed. It's called fireweed. It's a perennial flower that comes back year after year. It can, go, it can grow four to six feet high and even up to nine feet high, towering, nine feet tall. It gets its name because of what it can do. It is, it is one of the first plants that, that germinates or grows after there's been a fire. In fact, it's one of the first plants that came up after Mount St. Helens blew up in 1980. In, in England or Great Benton, it's known as, as uh, by another name, what is it called? Willow herb or something like that. It's called Rose Bay Willow herb. And it was, it was one of the first plants that colonized after London was bombed in World War II. And it added this beautiful color in an otherwise grim landscape, according to the U.S. Forestry Service. Everything had been burned and ruined, and yet beauty came out from it. And that's what's being announced to Jerusalem. You're in ruins because of the Babylonians and because of judgment upon you. But I'm going to be bring beauty for the ashes. I'm going to bring the people back home. I'm going to restore Jerusalem. He's, he's announcing this good news, this beauty for the ashes. In fact, the CEV puts verse 1, Your new day is dawning, Jerusalem. Your new day is dawning. There's a new beginning that's being announced here. That's what God can do. He can, bring, he can bring beauty from the ruins and the ashes. That's what's being announced. God gives his people in Jerusalem a new beginning. Not because they deserved it. Not because they were on their best behavior. Not because they earned it from the Lord in some way. No, verse 10 announces no because the Lord says, I'm going to extend my mercy and compassion upon you to reverse the situation. And Jesus, or the Lord says in verse 16, when all this happens, Judah will know that the Lord is their Savior, their Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. 
And the good news is not only is that announced and promised, but it does happen. It happens. Ezra and Nehemiah tells that story. Ezra especially talks about who, who is it that the, the Lord stirs his heart? Cyrus, the king of Persia. Just as, as Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 45. Cyrus of Persia, his heart is stirred. And what does he do? He decrees all of you among the Lord's people, come back home. Come back home. All of you who, who are among the Lord's people, come and let's, you can rebuild the temple. You, you can work on the city. You can move back. Come home, he says. That happens. Nehemiah also tells the account how the walls of Jerusalem, which were also lying in ruins and were burned down and in rubble, were also rebuilt. Beauty for ashes. He brings from the ruins gracious favor and compassion upon his people. And the people come back home. That's beauty for ashes, you see, because in exile, all they could do was think about home. All they could do is talk to the older generation who knew of this place that used to be home. But now the Lord says, come on home. <laughs> come back home. After years of exile, after dealing with all the ruin of Jerusalem and their homeland, thinking that God had forsaken them and forgotten them. If you read the other parts of Isaiah, he tells them, I didn't forget you. And here's the proof of that. Come back home. Isn't, so, isn't God so gracious? Isn't he so merciful? Isn't he so good? Isn't he so compassionate? That he can bring beauty from the ruins. And that's good news for us as well because, because we, need that, we need that same kind of work in our lives. And the Lord brings them back from the promised land, back home. So let me ask you again this morning, have you thought about home recently? Have you thought about home the Lord shines upon Jerusalem and it results in the return of the exiles, the restoration of the ruins, the renewal of their covenant relationship. That's also recorded in, in Nehemiah. Beauty for ashes. Here's what it means. It means that there is hope in the most ruinous of circumstances. It, it means that these, the, the, these broken people that we encounter, we as broken people who, who may be experiencing the ruin of our own destructive decisions, there's hope for them. It, it means that there's no lost cause in God's sight. It means that there, there is hope for those who are picking up the pieces of a devastating loss or unexpected bad news. It means there's hope for Jonathan Pentland. He's incarcerated in prison. He's, he's, uh, he's donned his grandson. And I received a letter from Jonathan this week who's, who's awaiting his sentencing in October. And here is in part what he wrote to me and to the church. He said, tell the congregation that I miss them dearly and I can't wait to come back to church when I get out. He says, I don't have a Bible. They have all my property somewhere that I can't get to it, but I hope to get one soon. Thank you for your letters. Thank you for the devotionals. I had a letter written to you, but I didn't get a chance to send it before they took me to the hole. I'm in the hole for jamming my door, but please continue to pray for me. Please, I could use all the prayers I can get. His situation is, is, is he could get up to 10 years in prison for the felony charges against him. He's hoping for 60 months, but he's dealing with the ashes of his destructive decisions. He's dealing with all that he gave himself to, and he freely admits that and has, and has entered a plea of guilty to all those charges. But he's dealing with the ashes and brokenness of all that. And the message is, the message of hope from Isaiah 60 is, that the Lord can not only restore broken walls, he can restore broken people. That's what he did for his people, Judah and Jerusalem. He restored them to right relationship, covenant relationship with them. And he can do the same for, for Jonathan. I love Donda's, uh, Donna's prayer for Jonathan. Yeah, I just talked to him on the phone while he was preaching about it. Okay. 
Okay, that's okay. Well, that's good that we're talking about him. We're going to pray for him. I love Donna's, Donna's prayer for him. And that is that, that the Lord would do this restorative work even in prison, so that even as he's serving his sentence, even as he's serving his sentence, he can, he can be used as the Lord's instrument. The affirmation this morning is that God is the God of new beginnings and beginnings. He can do that for Jonathan. He gave one to Jerusalem and Judah. And as I was praying Thursday, I realized and it occurred to me that there are a lot of people that need new beginnings in their relationships with people, especially family members. I had been praying for three or four people and it was the same situation. People dealing with broken relationships in their lives with family. It recalled a, a circumstance or a meeting I had when I was in Ohio this last Christmas, and I'll call him Spencer. I got together for breakfast with Spencer, and Spencer has not talked to or seen his brother very much the last several years. They don't talk to each other. They have a broken relationship. They can't go to their parents' house at Christmas together. If Spencer and his wife and kids are there, his brother won't come. His, girl, his brother's girlfriend won't come. It's, a, it's, just a, it's just a long time that this has been going on. In fact, in the midst of the breakfast conversation, he said something very sad. He said, at this point, I don't even remember what the conflict's about. The beginning of the feud is forgotten, but the distance between them grows wider and wider and wider. It's ashes. It's ashes. Spencer's tried to reach out to him, but there's no willingness on his brother's part. So there's just this ongoing enmity between them. But this passage from Isaiah 60 gives us courage to take heart that things can change, that God can bring a new beginning in people's lives. That's what he did for his people. I, I recall Jacob and Esau, who after years of enmity, they, they ran to one another, or Esau ran to Jacob, and they embraced and they wept together after all that time, after all that hostility, after all that unforgiveness, and they wept together. And I, and I believe that God can do that for Spencer and his brother. The Lord did it for his people. The Lord can rest restore broken relationships and bring healing and mending and reconciliation and, and forgiveness. Maybe, maybe Spencer will even be able to spend Christmas with his parents and his brother this Christmas. God's restoration of Jerusalem and the return of the exiles from Babylon is this first homecoming that announces that God can do this kind of restorative work. That God is the God of beginnings and new beginnings. But there is also pronouncements in verses 17 through 22 that are promises that have not yet reached their ultimate fulfillment and they look to or they point to another homecoming that still awaits for the people of God. Verses 17 through 22. Instead of bronze, I'll bring you gold. Instead of iron, I'll, I'll bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze. Instead of stones, iron. I will appoint peace as your overseer and righteousness as your master. Violence shall no more be heard of in your land. Devastation and destruction will not be heard of within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor the brightness shall the nor for the brightness shall the moon give light to you by night. But the Lord will be your everlasting light and your God will be your glory. Your sun, your sun shall no more go down or your moon withdraw itself for the Lord will be your everlasting light and your days of mourning shall be ended. Your people shall be all righteous, shall all be righteous and they shall possess the land forever. They are the shoot that I planted, the work of my hands so that I might be glorified. The least of them shall become a clan, the smallest of them a mighty nation. I am the Lord in its time. I will accomplish it quickly. Alec Moyer says, to confine this prophecy to just the return of Babylon is to fail to listen to what Isaiah has been saying. It does include that for sure, as we just covered, but he is looking for a, a, a worldwide gathering, 
And he says the reality is the winning of the nations by the gospel and the gathering of those who believe into the heavenly Zion. So as glorious as the return to Jerusalem will be for those exiles, as glorious as the restoration of Jerusalem that had been in ruins would be, there still awaits a more glorious day for the people of God. I recalled Isaiah 46.10 that applies to these verses. He makes known the end from the beginning. The Lord is making known from ancient times what is still to come. What's still to come? What's still to come? Part of what's being announced here is that there's going to be these promises that come to ultimate fulfillment. They aren't yet. In fact, George Knight adds that Revelation 21 is actually the ultimate outcome of this passage. That's why it was read this morning. So it's right and fitting to highlight this in order that the people of God will be renewed in their hope that one day they will be home. They will be at home with the Lord. That's the promise of Scripture, that we'll be together for the Lord forever. That's the promise of Revelation 21. Listen to it, that we'll be forever with the Lord. It was read this morning. Listen to it again. I hope this will reinvigorate your hope in the Lord and His promises. Listen to this promise. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Isaiah will talk about that later in, in the portions we're going to be looking at. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away, and the sea was no more. Then I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Here's the promise. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them. It's the promise will be forever with the Lord. John Wesley says, this vision reaches into the future after the former things pass away and all become new. This is a promise that is still to come. What is still to come? The new Jerusalem is still to come. Bible study note says the new Jerusalem will come to earth as the city of God for which Abraham and all God's faithful waited of which God is the architect and builder. He's referencing there uh, Hebrews 11, which talks about another city, a heavenly one, built by God, prepared by God, whose foundation is an architect and builder is God. Hebrews says, And the vision of Revelation 21 is that God will sit enthroned, and God's glory will give light to the city. That picks up on verses 19 through 20 here. The Lord will be her everlasting light. That's why John says there in Revelation by the, by the Spirit that the, the city won't need a temple because the Lord will be its everlasting light. The, the, or, the, or the city won't need a sun or a moon because the Lord will give its light and the nations will walk in that light. It's a, it's a, a wonderful picture of what is to come. That image of God as light is a, is a synonym for God's holiness in part. In fact, 1 John says it this way, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. That's why Revelation 21, 27 says, Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. I recall what Jesus told his disciples after they came back from their mission, all excited that the demons submitted to them in his name. He said, don't be excited about that. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Why? Well, because we will live with him and reign with him forever and ever. That's the promise. That's still to come. What's still to come? A peaceable kingdom. Verses 17 to 18. Did you read those promises? That's not like anywhere here on earth right now. Did you read those promises? A vision of peace and safety? It sounds like a utopian dream. No, no ruin, no destruction, no violence. We have the Remembers Flower Garden back here of people who have been murdered in Granby since 2019. One is a 14-year-old boy. No violence. No destruction. That's not, that's not going to happen while the old order of things exists, but the promise is here, a more glorious day awaits. A more glorious day awaits when that will be the reality. I recall Psalm 122, read this morning from the call to corporate worship. The psalm urges these sojourners who are going to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. 
He urges them, I want you to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I want you to pray and say, peace be upon her. I want you to pray in these kind of ways. And the promise here is this vision of what some call glorified Zion or the new Jerusalem is that that day is coming. That day is coming, the promise is. Indeed, 2 Peter says that the new heaven and new earth will be the home of righteousness and that will result in peace. That's beauty for ashes. What's still to come? Verse 20 says, your days of sorrow will end. Or the ultimate fulfillment of this verse is stated in Revelation 21.4. He will wipe away every tear from your eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, for the old order of things have passed away. The Wesley Bible study says these are some of the most comforting words in all of Scripture. I remember, I remember a few, uh, several months ago now, actually, I got off the phone with Monica Bosef of the Open Door Foundation. I recalled this conversation as I was studying this verse. And on the phone call, she told me that she had breast cancer and that she was already undergoing chemo treatments and that soon she would have to have surgery for that cancer. It was quite a shock to everyone because this, you know, this wasn't something they expected. I, it was a shock to me. I didn't know about that, and that that was happening. And after the conversation and hung up the phone, I just started crying and praying, Lord, this world is so broken. Why does the curse of cancer, why is that upon so many? Why does it have to be that way? Why, why, is, why, is, why is this suffering have to happen in her life? Some of you know that kind of suffering. She told me that as she took chemo, her body was out of commission for days because it took just such a strain on her body. And she had the surgery later on. But the promise here is there'll be a day when pain and suffering will be no more. That's beauty for the ashes. It's all still yet to come, but it will happen. <laughs> Just like the exile happened and them being brought back happened. Just like the Lord prophesied the first homecoming, this also will occur. Verse 22 says, it ends time, the Lord will accomplish it swiftly. In light of, uh, in light of this, John Wesley says, discipleship is like walking with fellow pilgrims to the road to the new Jerusalem. We walk alongside one another, we encourage one another, we love one another, and we have the hope before us. Of course, that doesn't mean we don't care about this world or about those whose names aren't written in the Lamb's Book of Life. What it means is we walk with this confidence knowing that this hope is sure, that it will come to pass, that these things will happen. So let me ask you again. Have you thought about home recently? In light of what's happened with, with Dick Arello, I would be remiss not to also extend this invitation. Tom and I were at McAllister's yesterday meeting, and there was a young man there who was working, and somebody asked him, how are you doing? He said, uh, I'm glad to be alive. And we got into a conversation with him during our meal, and he said something. I, I asked, is there a story behind that? I liked your answer. What, what's the story behind that? And he, and he just acknowledged that we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? That's the only way you'll be forever with the Lord. And how is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? You... You, receive, you respond to His grace. You respond to His invitation to follow after Him and to receive His forgiveness and to receive Him into your life and to walk with Him all the days of your life. That's the only way, by His grace, through faith. Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? That's the only way to be at home with the Lord and to walk with Him. I'm going to give us a time of prayer this morning. And invite you to respond to 
whatever the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about. Maybe it's about that last question I just asked you. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? And that you would respond to the Holy Spirit's urging you and speaking to you, and you would come to these altars of prayer and we'll pray for you. Or maybe it's in some other way that you would just rejoice and give them thanks for these promises and for this hope. I didn't, I didn't ask the musicians to be prepared for this, but if you wouldn't mind coming and pray, playing something here today as we have this time of invitation.